Oh, so my passion for economics, um, I, it, it comes from many sources. I think the biggest one is uh, for the benefit of humanity, or mankind as we used to call it, humanity, and also not just humanity, but for the broader world around us. Uh, I thought when I first began working on economics that it was, that it was clear that there were many economic problems that were unsolved. I think the ones I was most interested in when I first started were poverty uh, and macroeconomics or business cycles. Uh, and I've still wor I still am interested in those, but I, I veered off into other areas, particularly environmental economics and resource economics later. But I th the, the big passion was I thought economics was uh, a tool that one could use, like a, like a carpenter uses a tool to build something. It was an intellectual tool that could be used to improve people's well-being. My upbringing in, in New Mexico, I'd, I'd say, was, was very focused on the outdoors. My father was uh, interested in the outdoors. He was interested in skiing and fishing and uh, building things, um, interesting things like tramways. Uh, he was interested in Indian law uh, at that time, and in the later part of his life became one of the nation's leading Indian lawyers. So all of this had to do with uh, the outdoors. And so when I moved east to a more urban environment, I, I had that in my background. The in, my interest in climate change was a natural outgrowth of interests that evolved over time. So when I first became a serious, um, became seriously interested in economics in graduate school, uh, I was primarily interested in economic growth. I think it's quite interesting that the prize this year, which is really for, about economic growth, was what was my interest, actually has been my interest all my life in economics. And I started working on that, and I started working on technology. And for uh, four or five years, I worked on exactly the same area that Paul Romer got his prize for. But uh, I, I gave it up. I, it was too hard. So I just, it was too hard for me, so I moved on. And then I started worrying about um, some, but it was the same issue that, um, that the technology Romer work deals with, which is that markets cannot solve certain problems. Markets are very good at some things. They allocate bread, they allocate uh, gasoline, but they, um, they don't allocate technology efficiently, and they don't allocate energy and environmental issues efficiently. So I was always interested in these byproducts of, 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 climate, of uh, economic, I was always interested in the byproducts of economic growth. And so I worked first on energy, and then I worked, I worked on energy for, well, I've always worked on energy, I should say and then uh, gradually looked at some of the byproducts of energy production, and that very quickly led to climate change. Uh, I think it was the, th the, the place that uh, sort of crystallized that for me was in 1974. I went to the, uh, a new institute that had been formed in Vienna called the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, or IASA. And at that time, and it's, uh, it was it had a, just an extraordinary crop of brilliant, brilliant people. Uh, Director Howard Rafa from Harvard, my colleague Charlene Koopman, Alan Mann from Stanford, being among them. And there was a man named Alan Murphy. I shared a brilliant climatologist. I shared an office with, and so we naturally got started. And he said, "Well, why don't you think about this?" And so I started thinking about climate change. I think the main message of the work, I mean, it's not just my work, but the work of people in the area of climate change economics, integrated assessment modeling, as it's called, a kind of technical name, is uh, really twofold. One is it's to see the climate, climate change problem as a byproduct, an unintended byproduct of economic growth. And then the second thing is to understand that what we need to do is we need to correct that by fixing the price of emissions. So now emissions are free in most places, and 
not, not in Sweden, but every place else in the world outside of Western Europe, when you emit a ton of carbon dioxide, you don't probably know you're doing it or think of doing it probably, and you drive your car or you have a product that has combustion behind it that you're putting in the atmosphere and you're causing damage, but you're not paying anything for it. So the, the insight of economics is, once you go through that and you analyze it, it's to say, we need to put a price on these. And that way, uh, give people incentives to reduce their use of carbon fuels and or the products that use carbon fuels and thereby reduce their emissions. So it's uh, the key message of, of uh, economics is that this is this is a flaw in the market and it's correctable if governments take steps to change the price from zero to a high enough price that you can meet your targets. Um, so that, that, that is something I think is pretty easy to explain. But then the next step is, what is that price? And uh, I think the most interesting thing of all the work I've ever done is that in building models of this, the price just comes out of it. It's just one of the byproducts of, of the, it's called linear programming is the technical name for it. But it has another technical thing called a dual variable, which is this is the price that you should set on carbon dioxide emissions if you're going to meet your goal. And it's a, I think of it as kind of a mathematical miracle in the sense that you can do this and then out pops the price that the government should set. Well, my message is you by yourself can do nothing. Uh, there are too many people doing too much for too many generations of people. So even if I'm the most ethical person, or even if I'm not just an ethical person, but I'm going to represent 10 or 100 other people who are not so ethical uh, or don't care about it, uh, the, the effect I alone, and I want to emphasize the word alone, will have is insignificant. It's like a billionth of a billionth or a trillionth of, of what is necessary. So what is necessary is that people act through their governments and their governments act together with other nations to, to take steps to solve this problem. I don't want to say there's a single step you can take because there are multiple things to do. But I'd say the message is you need to exercise your, um, your duties and responsibilities as citizens, as voters, or in places where they're not voters, as, where there are no democracies, as protesters, uh, work through governments, work through nonprofit organizations, uh, work through schools uh, to, to persuade people that we need to take steps to do this. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking this step by yourself to um, curb your own <laughs> to curb your own emissions or to turn the heat down or uh, whatever that, that, that's fine but but that by itself is not sufficient well as I've been working on this long enough to see that um, things change uh, and change slowly. I'd say over the period since I've been working, I started working on this in the 1970s, um, there's, been, there's been a lot of progress in the science, the social sciences as well as the natural sciences. I've seen considerable change in viewpoint of uh, professionals, of scientists, uh, interested scientists, of concerned citizens. So I, I think there's a, now a great, really great realization of the problem, the solutions, and so on. Um, so in that, in that respect, I think it's been a good movement. At the same time, the politics uh, has moved backwards in, in the last, um, say, last couple of years, maybe more, maybe, maybe a little bit more, uh, with uh, people, particularly the American president, who is, makes ludicrous statements about climate change. Um, but I think it's spread. It's, it's spread. So there, there's, uh, we have, in all of our big countries, we have problems of leaders who are really not not thinking about global problems. They're not even thinking about problems often in a sensible way. 
So it's, uh, what I like to say is two steps forward, one step backwards. Maybe it's a big step backward now. Um, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will um, get over that and, and move forward again. People often learn their social, political, scientific views when they're in school and uh, they, they get hardwired into their brain and, and their emotions and uh, it's sometimes very difficult for people to, to change. So often our leaders will be taught things 20, 30, 40, 50 years old and so they're not really ready for the challenges of today. They're not ready for the challenges of climate change. Climate change is one example. Another one is cyber security. I mean, I think that people, half the people in leadership in the world don't actually know anything about, uh, about information technology. So how can they appreciate the threats of it? Um, and I think that's now changing a little bit. But I think when it first came, you say, well, these people know nothing about computers. How could they possibly? understand the threats of cybersecurity. So it's a little the same climate change. They, they, they grew up, they went to college. So I, I view the most important job that I do is, is teaching because you see people in, at college age, I think of 18 to 22, they have the most amazing open and plastic minds. I'm just, I'm just absolutely astounded that a student will come in at the beginning when I say teach macroeconomics and they'll know nothing. They'll know nothing about international trade. They know nothing about how the exchange rates work. They will know nothing about um, how the economy is affected. And by the end of the time they, they basically they basically know what a professional economist knows. And it's and it's just so easy. And then they'll and they'll you know they'll forget half of it, of course, but it's somewhere deep in their brain they'll know it. So when they run into it five or 10 or 20 or 30 years later, say, oh yes, I learned that at Yale. So it's, it's this, this is the generation that I love working with because there's a, there's a brilliance of mind but also plasticity and an ability to absorb new ideas and to challenge also, to challenge when, I, when poor ideas are put to them. So that's what teaching means to me. I had so many of them, um, and I, I was I was just blessed both at Yale as an undergraduate and MIT as a graduate student, and then in a way is also in my professional life as having so many teachers that um, teachers and, and often later colleagues and co-authors. Um, I think the one that I particular in this partic in this area in climate change, the one I particularly point to would be Challing Koopmans. Charlie Koopmans was, uh, he was Dutch, and he, he, left, um, he left Holland right before World War II. Uh, he was very much aware of the, of the, of the Nazi menace in, in Western Europe. Uh, went to America. He, he then worked in America on mathematics and uh, invented his, his a very important linear program technique when he was working on shipping convoys in World War II. Uh, went to Chicago, then he came to Yale, and he was a colleague, colleague at Yale. And he influenced me not just because he was interested in, in energy and climate change, uh, but because of his and, and enthusiastic and also his mentorship. And his, I wasn't really a mentor at that stage, it was more his, uh, his enthusiasm for the subject and his enthusiasm for my work. Um, uh, and the techniques he used were ones that I that were different from what everyone else was using. And they have, the, the, what I pointed out to earlier, this business about the shadow price, the dual variable that gives you the price of carbon. This came out of work he did. And if I hadn't used that technique, I wouldn't have found it. Um, and actually, I think he 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 was the first person I ever found mentioned climate change in the Nobel lectures or speeches. In, in the December of 1975, he actually mentioned it in his toast at the banquet. Uh, so he, I'll just mention him because he was a wonderful colleague, a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist and just a very generous and 
a man as well. But there were many, many others, but I'd, since in this context, I would particularly associate with Charlie and Koopmans. I think it's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful to be, to share this with Paul Romer uh, for lots of reasons. Um, one is I, I have a great admiration for his work. Um, what Paul Romer got the prize for, as he will explain, is, is opening up the box of technological change. In the earlier work that had been done in economic growth, uh, the work that I learned in graduate school, technological change was taken as a given. It was just what's, what's known as exogenous. That means sort of falling from heaven and not produced by humans. It just, it just comes to you. And everybody knew that's wrong. Everybody knows that we produce great technologies. We, you know, we produce the steam engine and the idea for the steam engine and the steam engine, the idea for the transistor and the transistor and modern electronics, the idea for the telephone and then the telephone and now telecommunications. Everybody knows that it, was, it didn't just come floating down from some intellectual heaven, but it was invented by people, but it wasn't in our models. And so this was, this was we knew this, and we'd actually tried. To, I'd actually tried to work on that myself. As I said, it was too hard, so I gave it up. But that was the problem that Paul Romer tackled, uh, and and solved, and and produced this really brilliant new way of thinking about technologies. So I, I think it's it's really nice for me to, to share it with Paul, partly because that was a problem I thought about and worked on and and failed at when and when I was a graduate student, and then partly also coming to today because um, it's clear that the solutions to problems like climate change involve exactly what he's talking about, finding ways to induce new technologies, finding ways to get people to think about them, to develop, invent them, to develop the products and processes, to make sure they're commercial, to get them out in the world. So they, these are, this is the issue he's thought of. And using his insights in the climate change area. Uh, so marrying those two is, I think, a critical, critical uh, need in the, over the next few years, if we are to succeed. One of the things is, is to understand it's not a linear process. It's not, you sit down, with a blank piece of paper. I know, you, I know you, nobody thinks this, but just to emphasize, you sit down with a blank piece of paper and you say, climate change, and underline, and say, number one, number two, number three. And you say, okay, there's the problem, let's go solve it. So uh, often things will occur while you're outside walking around, where you'll see something, where you'll talk to somebody, where you'll um, maybe, some t actually, an art exhibit will will stimulate some thinking. Um, uh, a problem, obviously, problems. When you see problems, um, for example, one one an example of a problem was when um, in 2002-2003, when the U.S. was about to go to war in Iraq. And it, we were just marching, marching. I mean, it's not World War One. If you, and Europeans will know the history of World War One, they're marching, marching, sleepwalking into history, so to speak. And we were just marching along. And it, it wasn't 100 percent, but it was pretty clear. And the question is, how costly is this going to be? And so I, I started working on the cost of the Iraq War. Did a, a pretty big study on that. Uh, but that's that was one where the, you just the, the problem is right in front of you, and you say, well. How much is this going to cost? Do we have we thought about the costs of this? Talk to people. Well, yes, it's not going to be very expensive, but of course, instead of fifty billion dollars, it's like two, three, four trillion dollars. I mean, just vastly, vastly underestimating. But that's something where it's a problem oriented. Other times, um, it's just curiosity. Just some. I mean, the, the, the an example of a curiosity was I, w I was thinking about light and whether we're measuring light correctly and uh, so the, and the, that uh, just something I thought about and then I forgot about it, and then I thought about it another year later and I thought about it. and then something would happen I'd see something I say oh that's how to do that and uh, and then I got interested and then worked intensively on it um, so I, it's, it's usually there's sometimes a problem sometimes just pure curiosity about something when you want to 
was it measured correctly? For example, in the lighting is a good example. With lighting, there was a big, it was, there's the background of lighting was, there was a big controversy about whether price indexes were being measured correctly. This was particularly in the United States, and there was a big report by a Stanford a colleague named Mike Boskin, the Boskin Report, and he argued that the consumer price index in the United States was seriously mismeasured. And that looked right. And part of the problem was we weren't measuring quality change correctly, so that looks right. And, uh, and I looked at some other price indexes, like European price indexes are even worse than the U.S. price indexes. So then at that point I said, well, what about light? Are we measuring the price of light correctly? So at that point then I would say, well, how are we going to measure? We've got to, you know, we can look at different sources, oil, electricity, compact fluorescent. That was before the LED bulb. And then you say, well, we're measuring incorrectly because we're measuring them by the price of the light bulb rather than how much it costs to produce a certain number of lumen hours. So that was just, I'd say that was just pure curiosity that drove that. I've, I've received, obviously, as many Nobelist laureates do, a lot of emails, in these days emails, a few phone calls, a few letters, and then personal congratulations from colleagues that I knew in New Haven, know in New Haven, friends. Um, and I think the most interesting thing that, about it is that um, this particular award that for climate change, I mean, I, Yes, it's economics, but people think this is an award for somebody who's working on climate change. And people think this is, this is like a light in a, in a dark time. And um, they see this as, as, as a very important institution, the, really the premier scientific award institution of the world, saying uh, to the world, and, and particularly America, I mean, this is their Americans, they think particularly useful to Americans, uh, n to take heart, uh, even if, I don't think the noble, I, I don't say you're saying this, this is what they think you're saying, the people, and why they're so happy about it is because they think they're say, you're saying, take heart, um, there is good work out there, uh, there are people who care about you in the United States and the rest of the world, um, and um, just stay with it, keep hard, and, and uh, we have people who are working, working for good. So I, w I think it was very interesting, and I, I think um, I'm, I'm very grateful for that, particularly that, that it gives a kind of courage and heart to the people who are, who are on the right side of history. Mm -hmm.